Thank you for joining us for Records of Deception, Forgeries and the Integrity of the Historical Record, a panel discussion that is part of a larger series of conversations that we're hosting here at Rare Book School in lieu of our summer programming. My name is Barbara Heritage, and I'm the Associate Director and the Curator of Collections here at Rare Book School. Speaking on behalf of the school, we're grateful to be able to host this panel, which brings together four RBS faculty members who have each conducted groundbreaking work on forgeries, fakes, and copies from different parts of the world at different points in time. We envision the following conversation as not only building on their individual expertise, but also as opening up a dialogue about the larger impact that fakes and forgeries are having on our collections, as well as our understanding of history itself. Our hope is that this conversation will call attention to the more salient issues that these four experts are addressing in their work as well as productive strategies for identifying fakes and forgeries when we encounter them, whether in special collections or the antiquarian marketplace. I'm Joan Friedman and I'll be co-moderating this panel with Barbara Heritage. In my previous life as an art historian and rare book curator, I worked for many years at the Yale Center for British Art and published studies on fakes, forgeries, and facsimiles. It's a pleasure to return to the subject now given all the fascinating work that's been accomplished in this area in recent years. In putting together this panel, we attempted to include a range of perspectives and experience. Our panelists include the scholar bookseller, Brian Cassidy of Type Punch Matrix, who is conducting groundbreaking work on the identification of 20th century duplicative processes. Julie Nelson Davis, an art historian at the University of Pennsylvania, who is recognized as one of the world's foremost authorities on Japanese prints and illustrated books. Nick Wilding, a professor at Georgia State University, who uncovered the forgery of Galileo's Sidereus Nuncius to international acclaim and to the horror of a number of renowned experts who had been misled by the forgery. And finally, Kevin Young, director of the Schomburg Center for Research, excuse me, in Black culture, who is the author of the award-winning study, Bunk, The Rise of Hoaxes, Humbug, Plagiarists, Phonies, let's see if he can, and Post-Facts post fa and Fake News, which uh, my green screen is having trouble <laughs> distinguishing <laughs> from me. Here we go, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Our panelists will be exploring six questions that Barbara Heritage and I have prepared for them before we open up the conversation to live Q&A. Because this portion of the session is being recorded, we request that you turn off your video feeds and keep your microphone muted during the initial portion of the meeting. At 5 p.m., we will open up the conversation to live Q&A. At that later time, we will be taking questions via Zoom's chat feature. We ask that all participants maintain a respectful dialogue in keeping with RBS's code of conduct. Great, thanks Joan. And without further ado, we're gonna kick off the conversation with our first question. And I'm gonna be asking Kevin this question first, and then we'll go and um, talk to other panelists. Um, so to begin, forgeries are distinct from facsimiles in their maker's specific intention to deceive readers and other audiences. Each of you have worked on this question, but with respect to different kinds of materials and in different regions of the world. Please briefly describe the motives of the forgers you've identified or studied. Why did they create their forgeries? To what end? And again, we'll, we'll start with Kevin here. Thanks so much, it's uh, good to be here. Uh, talking about one of my favorite subjects, fakery. Um, I think, you know, the answer is money, <laughs> um, but not simply money. You know, I, I think there's cheaper ways to uh, earn it. Um, but I think sometimes, especially say in art history, uh, it's often proved they can. I can paint as well as uh, Matisse. But I think it's also to argue, uh, to make themselves part of history or prove a theory, say. Um, there's a, things like Thomas Wise, who uh, over the 19th century and into the 20th forged so much stuff and was selling it to the British Library. And um, 
I don't think it was simply money, but it was also a question, I think, of power. And I think we need to talk about that a bit more. But, um, you know, money is sort of the immediate motive, perhaps. But I think there's, as I said, other ways you can go about making money. Why this one? And for me, the, the questions of power are part of it. Part of it is changing history. And uh, I argue in Bunk that he, in sort of forging some of uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's uh, poetry, uh, some about runaway slaves, for instance, um, he's really changing the record on enslavement and thinking about power uh, in really disturbing ways. He also is, you know, in the relationship that the Brownings had that was of course famous. Um, and he's also sort of muddling with that when they gave each other this and when they gave each other that, the pieces they wrote for each other. So it's sort of a really intimate revenge in some way, uh, as well as a, an intimate way to make a few bucks, I think. Uh, and in his case, facsimiles quickly became fakes um, and that distinction, I think, uh, goes away pretty quickly. Thank you, Kevin. Um, there's so much there to unpack, and I'm sure we're going to do that as part of the conversation. Nick, um, would you take that on next? So what, what are some of the motives um, of the forgers that you've identified and studied? Uh, well, I, would, I think it's useful to pick up Kevin's point there that um, forgeries and fakes aren't to be distinguished by the intentionality of their production, but more by their use. Uh, so they can become quite unmoored from their actual initial uh, authorial, if that's the right word, intention. Uh, I'm going to just share an image now. I hope this works. Um, does that come up? There we go. So this, uh, familiar enough, image, um, Sidarius Nuncius. This is uh, the digitized version of the Sidarius Nuncius in the National Library in Madrid. And I was looking at this because it wasn't cataloged uh, or wasn't included in the census that had been done. And I thought I discovered a new copy uh, or a new old copy. And then I had discovered a new copy, but it's actually a facsimile. It's a 1960s facsimile which has been digitized. And when I contacted the National Library, um, they said, yeah, we've, we've realized that this is actually a facsimile, but we did have a real one. So what had happened here is that a facsimile had been, I've, I've got my own facsimile here, and it says facsimile in it. So it was produced as a facsimile, but then a thief had slipped this in. Now it becomes a forgery, and the genuine copy has gone elsewhere. So I think that objects can oscillate quite easily between these very different uh, categories. Um, and it's not all to do with intentionality. Motive is hard to work out because forgers are often liars. Um, and so you get claims of this was a practical joke, this was a hoax, I wasn't, I, or I was mocking academia, all, all those kinds of things. I think money is the primary uh, bottom, bottom dollar here. Uh, but historically, there have been other motives. So we see, for instance, uh, the famous case of the 18th century uh, facsimile slash forgery. I'm not sure what it is. The reprinting of a 1527 uh, Boccaccio de Cameron. Um, which seems to have been done basically because by, by a, an English Protestant because the book had been censored and he just wanted to flood the market with a book that shouldn't exist in Italy. So there it's a religious act. It's a, a protesting um, act, which I, d I don't know if that's forgery. I don't know if the motive was to, to make money. Um, the more recent cases we've seen especially the one that I've become kind of sucked into, the Massimo de Caro one, definitely money, political power, patronage systems, um, inserting oneself into the story, trying to be in the room where it happened 400 years late, all of those are, are definitely uh, the, the prime motives. Thanks, Nick. Julie, talk about your, your subjects and their motivations, please. I think she's muted. Julie, 
Julie, could you unmute yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry. Ah, so excited about sharing my screen that I forgot to unmute myself. Thanks everyone for having me. Um, I have to have images because I'm an art historian, um, but I wanna come back to the point here and say often, you know, the forgers I've studied, it's about money. First of all, it's about money, but it's also about recognition of talent, about fame and being part of the game. And I think I can add an, another uh, a dimension here around power and that has to do with sort of national identity and um, promotion of, of a sort of nation state process um, uh, that's part of this kind of use of soft power. But throughout Japanese art, art, there are fakes that go all the way back. Um, you can probably go back to the earliest kinds of things and find fakes there. In my field in the 18th century, there's a famous case of Shiba Kokon, who we can see here on the right, who imitated his teacher, um, Harunobu, and signed it Harunobu. And these are still things that, I mean, people who are trained in understanding the stylistic differences um, can recognize, but still we often see these um, still being presented as, as real Harunobus. And the way you can tell right away is that Shiva Kokan was interested in Western visual um, uh, schemes of representation. So the one on the right shows a, you know, one point perspectival system. Harunobu never did that. So now you know. So that whenever you come across a Harunobu print, it can tell a difference. But what's really interesting to me is the ways in which um, in the, in the late 19th century, after Japan opened to the West and started um, selling a lot of things out to the market, we see a great number of things, literally tons of things, boatloads of things coming out from Japan. And we've got a kind of perfect storm opportunity here for real things and for fake, fake things to flood the market. And we have people in Paris, such as um, Siegfried Bing and Hayashi Tadamasa who are um, receiving these things, you know, tens of thousands of things and selling them. And if you go through their catalogs now with an eye to uh, work that's been done since, you can find many, many things that we think of as either copies or um, forgeries of different kinds. And they sold a lot of these to really eager collectors like um, Charles uh, Freer, just one of many collectors who, who purchased these things. And what's interesting is that Freer kept very detailed records and he even talks about having worked with the dealer uh, Kobashi Bunshichi, that shadowy figure in the lower right. And you know, this person is somebody I'm trying to track. This is the only known photograph we have of him uh, from a large group, group photo. He, he resisted the camera, um, which is also something we see, but he um, was likely making things for this market. And at one point Freer says, I will not buy from that guy anymore. So there's a kind of recognition, but in this moment, things are actively being made because people like Freer say, and I think this is another part of it, he's no longer interested in prints because prints are made with wood block carvers and printers in the publishing scheme. He wants things from the real hand of the artist. So there's a kind of moment where there's this sense of you can get closer to the genius if you have the brushwork. So that's another thing I think that um, uh, forgers take up. And it, it's apparent when we start to see things like this painting on the left, it's in the Freer collection, um, which uh, is signed Uchimaro, not at all in Uchimaro style, has really um, clear features like this shading down here in the lower section. That's not at all an 18th century move. This is a 19th century move. The splattering of pigment over the surface, all these things are dead giveaways. Um, but then you find out that it's one of seven known copies. And whether there's an actual painting here that's the original is still an open question. So what I'm seeing here are people who are actively also, also using this moment to say, I'm as good as those people in the past I'm going to do this to make money, but I'm also, it's also part of this kind of interesting moment where Japan is, is, is trying to uh, create a market for its work. It's also, don't forget, at the end of the 19th century, becoming a major imperial power in the East Asia region. So soft power is another part of, of the story here, at least in, in my uh, case. So it's, it's kind of re reflecting and reifying a lot of the things we've already heard, but it's still the same case. Okay, stop. Thanks, thanks Julie. Um, Brian. Um, 
I, I'm going to agree with most of my colleagues um, that, that certainly money is seems to be the primary uh, uh, driver of a lot of this. Um, as a member of the trade, um, I, I tend to look a little more skeptically at sort of the other motivations, um, being that the main motivation that I tend to see is the monetary one. Um, and I, I tend to think that, um, you know, without that gasoline, the forgery engine doesn't really run. Um, and if you just think about the number of examples that we know where money was involved versus where it wasn't, they just sort of pale in comparison. You know, for every Mark Landis, um, who, you know, some of you may remember a few years ago was, was a gentleman who kept donating forged um, paintings to various museums and institutions. He wanted nothing out of them. He didn't take an IRS donation. He took no money. Um, he just kind of wanted to insert himself and, and sort of be noticed and paid attention to. I feel like for every one of him, there's 10, 20, 30 of, of other uh, forgers who are very clearly doing this for monetary gain. Um, I also think that the point that, that Nick brought up is really interesting, um, which is that actually often the motivation doesn't really matter sometimes. Um, and I like Nick's term of these objects kind of becoming unmoored from their original contexts. For me, often the first question is not sort of, is this forged or is it not? Often the first question for me just is, what is this? Um, and often what I see as a dealer are things that are not forgeries or intended to deceive, but just aren't as they are described. So you can think of things like secretarial signatures um, for public figures versus their authentic signatures. You can think of um, in the areas that I tend to work in in duplication, um, where I most often see problems is not with forgeries and fake uh, fakery, um, although I do see that, but I more often see later regenerations that were probably made never with an intent to deceive, um, that are sold as originals. And you see this very often with punk flyers, um, where in the 70s and the 80s, it was very common for you to take a flyer that might have been original off your friend's wall, Xerox it, take yours home and put it up on the wall. And 20 or 30 years later, you forget that that's what happened, or your heirs forget that that's what's happened. And suddenly, again, now you have this object um, that was never originally intended to deceive, but is still uh, corrupting the record. Um, so, so for me, it's often just a question of what am I looking at? Wow, this is fantastic. Thank you. Um, Joan's going to take on the next question. And, and I think that actually um, brings us to the next question, which is how have forgers created fake documents in the past? Just slapping it on a Xerox machine? Um, and how are forgers leveraging new technologies to create authentic looking fakes that might be harder to detect today? Please speak about how these forgeries are being tracked in your own line of work, whether in the antiquarian book trade, special collections, or among academic scholars. And uh, Julie, why don't you start us off with that? Okay, thanks. Um, I'll go back to my, my slides here again and to say a few words about that. Well, you know, how, how, how were things made in the past? I mean, how were fake documents made in the past? I want to show you a couple of examples of really interesting uh, fakery or improvement. And this is a, a famous case from uh, 1920 when Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect, who was at that point supporting himself mainly as a dealer of Japanese prints, was in Japan and he was working on the um, Imperial Hotel Commission in Tokyo. Uh, he was uh, told uh, by someone that there was this otherwise unknown collection and he needed to go up into the mountains with this guy and, and find it and he got this collection and he brought, he said, oh my gosh, these are really beautiful prints. And he brought them back and he sold them to all of his uh, regular um, buyers. And uh, within a few uh, weeks, he was told, um, no, these are not originals. These are revamped prints. So these are prints that someone took an original print. Um, they uh, carved new blocks to match certain areas. And then they carefully reprinted that color in the, in the areas. And you can see the revamped uh, copy on the right that he, frankly, right, donated to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and they've kept there. And that's a really great example for us to learn more. But you can see what the original um, print looked like on the left. It was, you know, it's, it's got, the colors have faded because all the colors are um, natural pigments. But this is more what you um, would expect. So this is a really great example. Another super famous example in my field is the Schumpelon forgery of 1934 where 19 paintings were reportedly found in an old daimyo storehouse called the Shumpuan. 
They were authenticated by an, uh, an expert and put on sale and then subsequently revealed as fakes. And this is a really interesting case because it turns out that um, Mr. Uh, Yato Senkuro was going to various um, flea markets and finding old paintings and then cleaning them so that he had the original uh, surface, right, an original silk or paper that would, you know, be appropriate for the period. And then his son uh, was able to uh, copy from magazines and he did that using um, this de device uh, uh, here to, that allowed him to, oh my goodness, to uh, enlarge the um, image from the source and then make a new copy. You know, what we're looking at here is a really fascinating case, one that I've been puzzling over for a couple of years, where the one on the right is signed Uchamaro, and it's known now to be a Shumpulon forgery. Uh, it's supposedly a copy of the picture on the left, whose authenticity has recently, well, in various moments in time, been called into question. So then we have a question, like, was the son copying a picture of a painting that may have already been uh, a, a newly created work of art? Or is there another thing beyond this? And what's interesting is if you look at the upper section over here in this area and over here in this area, what's, what we can see in the Shumpulan forgery is they've actually, actually corrected a mistake that's in the architecture in the example on the left. You notice this pillar here does not really support this roof. They've corrected that in the, um, in the Shumpulan forgery, which creates a whole another set of questions and problems around this. So this is a really interesting case. And what's the problem here for me is that, you know, these guys, we've tracked these people because they, we've, this became a, a major trial, major event. But <clears throat> how many others were there and how many other things have already gone out into the market? It's a kind of question that we are still um, trying to kind of deal with. Um, so in, in my case, this is how, how we've, we've uncovered some of this. And later on, I can talk about some of the methods that we use um, to, to um, un unpack these things. But these are some of the cases of the famous cases from the past. Wow. Um, Nick, what can you show us or tell us that, <laughs> about techniques? Uh, no images for this one, and I'll be fairly quick. I th so I think it's useful to think of um, that point about facsimiles and forgeries being uh, not two distinct activities and uh, two modes of production, but often there being a kind of spectrum bet between them. Uh, so basically any technique or technology or practice that's been used to repair work or copy work or perfect uh, the perceived defects of a work can also be used to uh, repair entirely a non-existent work into existence. Right. Um, so you could see everything from, if we're talking about, say, Western typographic prints, everything from pen facsimiles through to you know, type facsimiles, an incredibly laborious, almost Borgesian undertaking to reset the entire book, that does happen. Uh, even for quite substantial books. And it's insane. It, it kind of um, makes the monetary question look really weird there because you actually have to remake all the type. Uh, if you're serious about it, maybe remake paper in the traditional uh, anachronistic at that point manner. Um, so, and, and then I think as we move into the 19th century and uh, photographic facsimiles uh, become possible we start to see uh, probably, um, I mean, for, for other reasons as well, uh, those described in, in Bunk as well, a kind of culture of, of hoaxing uh, really uh, coming into existence, which uh, is related still to this repair work and this completely, at, at that point in time, ethical practice of supplying in facsimile missing material. Um, and then as we move through the 20th century, we see a wider and wider range of, uh, of techniques and technologies coming into existence. Uh, and our current phase of digitization, digital image, imaging, uh, photopolymer plates, 
uh, being able to mimic uh, quite a lot of the aspects, though not all, of letterpress uh, typographic printing um, brings us to possibly a new phase of extremely uh, disconcerting uh, forgeries. Although I think, I think Julie's point, um, Julie's example showed us as well that what we tend to see in a forgery is frequently a repro reproduction of a reproduction technique of an object. Uh, and if you look at something like the fake Vermeers, they really look like uh, 1940s color photographs of Vermeers rather than Vermeers. So we're sometimes seeing that, um, that kind of replication of the experience of seeing what we know should exist without access to the original object. And it's quite possible, I think, that our current digital facsimile, facsimile based um, forgeries will just look quite bizarrely weird, like a 1970s photo looks weird to us now, quite dateable uh, as we uh, ourselves move into new technologies of, of forgery. Um, you, the question also touched on uh, how they're being tracked, how forgeries are being tracked in the, the book trade special collections or among academic scholars. I don't think we've really established any good tools yet. I, I think it's still local networks, words of, word of mouth, establishing networks of credibility between dealers, collectors, uh, a certain amount of exclusion of people that you know are selling uh, dodgy goods. Uh, but it's very, very informal and ad hoc, and that's kind of disturbing. And it's also very um, unclear what should happen to a, an identified forgery. Should it be destroyed? Should it be stamped forgery? Uh, this is a question that the art world has been wrestling with as well. Um, one good technique is something that the, the Beinecke is starting to adopt, which is buying them and having a collection of forgeries. New York Public Library also has a its collection of known forgeries as a kind of reference resource and also a way of putting them in a cage so that they're not out on the market messing up constantly uh, the, the record. I'll stop there. Brian? Um, for duplicated materials, um, you know, what's interesting about them is, is really only in the last 20 years have they really started to bring any kind of money that would make anybody want to uh, uh, forge them. And, and before that, when you tended to see forgery with, with duplicated materials, it tended to be the realm of, of forensic document examiners. Um, in, in other words, it tended to be a legal question, um, people forging contracts and things like that. And a lot of my, but when I was just starting um, this research, a lot of the best uh, resources that I found were actually resources for document examiners. Um, but now, um, you know, now that various zines like Sniff and Glue or uh, literary magazines like Ed Sanders FU um, are bringing real money, um, I think that's something that we need to be more concerned about. And, when, and, and you, if you can imagine um, that it's very easy to often reproduce the material using the same reproduction techniques that they were originally produced with, you can see how this could very easily become a problem. Um, ironically, though, um, unlike I think with other for forms of forgery, um, with duplication, I'm more often seeing the low hanging fruit being forged more often than, than the more difficult to reach fruit um, because the more expensive material tends to just attract more scrutiny. Um, so I like I went on eBay this morning and just did sort of a, a, a quick search of recently sold um, vintage punk flyers. That was, the, that was the search term that I used. And I would say at least a third and probably as many as a half were problematic in one form or another. Um, but these are only selling for 40 to 80 bucks. And before that wouldn't have been a, a sort of a price point for lack of a better term, that wouldn't be a price point where most forgers work. Um, but nowadays when you can sort of run down to Kinko's and run off a semi or reasonably convincing uh, facsimile or forgery, um, that's actually pretty easy money. Um, and I think actually that gets to what I think the, the most important technology that's being leveraged now for forgery is, and that's just the internet. Um, right now it is much easier to sell forged material than it's probably ever been in history because you don't need a middleman of any kind. You can go on eBay, you can go on Amazon, you can be, go on Abe and be your own middleman. Um, and, uh, and also, and I don't think we think about this enough, it's also easier than ever to find information that could be useful to a forger. 
Um, and the, the example that I love to give about this is, is, you know, if you think about authorial signatures, and I'm going to use the example of J.K. Rowling, who, in my opinion, is at the moment, for better or worse, um, the most widely forged signature out there right now. I think probably upwards of 90 or 95 percent of what I see um, on the market is clearly forged. Um, and uh, uh, I would say um, that because the truth is she signed relatively few books, um, you know, uh, and um, most of the owners who have those books are sort of demographically not yet at the age where they're going to want to unload them. So we're dealing with kind of a very small subset of authentic materials. If Rowling had published her books in the 70s and the 80s, you can imagine how it would have been more difficult to find an authentic example of her signature. Well, that's not hard anymore. You can find that online. Um, but then there's sort of this double irony now, which is now when you go online and you look for exemplars of her work um, or of her signature, almost all of the examples that you're looking at are fake. So if you have a fake and you're looking at fakes, you now have a situation where they're kind of authenticating each other. And ironically, her authentic signature is the one that looks like it's the odd person out, the odd, the, uh, the odd duck out, um, and kind of delegitimizes it. Um, and that's all, uh, that's all a, 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 a result of the internet and, and really kind of puts us in new terrain, I think. Evan? Oh, this is uh, very fascinating. There's so much to say. Um, I think that one technology I'd point to is not a um, traditional technology, but almost an ancient one and also an extra uh, physical object one, which is the story. I think the story is often used as a technology to promulgate fakes. Um, it's in many ways, some of what uh, Brian is saying, because the technology that actually might make a fake or that helps people provide a story like the internet can also debunk it. And it's a little true, I find, when I'm writing about journalists, for instance, journalists usually catch the fake journalism. Um, so there's a kind of uh, policing there um, and sort of uh, ironies. But for instance, something like the Hitler diaries in the 1980s, um, one of the reasons that um, people were convinced it was genuine is because they went to the shelf and they pulled off a uh, account of history and they saw there, you know, Hitler was indeed at that place. Well, that's what the forger used to, to say those, you know, to write it. And there's things that wouldn't have been known to Hitler at the time, but that the history books could tell you. And so the authenticating device um, that the forger used is the same one that the researcher used. So there's also this kind of double bind. The thing that I would, I guess, provoke us to think about is, uh, is authenticity or should I say power and beyond that race, is that a kind of technology at work in forgery? You know, we were talking, uh, seeing those beautiful and also troubling Japanese prints makes us think about nation building, you said, but also how much is, uh, say, American tied up in these kind of forged documents and fakery, uh, whether it's fake stories about George Washington or just our sort of need to have these stories be told and be sort of coherent. Uh, they often require kind of a leap or a fake. Um, and, you know, there's many cases, I don't want to get into every last one, that, that do that for us. And I think something like uh, the Vermeer fakes by Van Meegeren, they also tell this other kind of disturbing story, which is they're trying to convince us of something. The Hitler diaries weren't simply, uh, you know, here's what I did today. They were also trying to make an argument of Hitler as a little bit, it's kind of hitler light, you know? It's really disturbing what they're trying to get us to believe. Um, and the group of people who were surrounding it were sort of believers already, and it just reaffirmed some of the things that they suspected or thought. And so that's another thing that we have to think about. I think Brian pointed out, you know, the middleman is gone, uh, and that kind of quality is interesting because it usually takes more than one person to, to fake or, or to forge specific, specifically. You need the forger, the seller, the, you know, uh, buyer. You need a number of people. Um, but you also have to have those people believe some of the same things. Um, and some are innocently, quote unquote, and some, you know, like a authenticator might want to believe that Vermeer had a religious phase, which was part of the, the issue in, in the fake Vermeer. So to present, be presented with it, it's like, aha, I was right. Uh, and that kind of quality, I think, also is nefarious in forgery in a bigger sense, in our fake news era. There's things that are fake that we, that convince us that we were right. Uh, and we have to always be on the lookout for that. Fascinating. Yeah. Tell me about it. This is great. Um, next question. Um, 
So you each in your own professions have tracked and studied forgeries. Do you believe that forgeries are on the rise or that they are posing an increased threat in the present moment that librarians, booksellers, and academics need to keep in mind? And we're gonna kick off this question with Nick and then move on to Julie and so on. Uh, let me see if I can share my desktop again. Okay, so I thought that they were, I thought that I'd established some kind of algorithm uh, whereby we could identify forgeable documents and that it would be short, expensive, not super rare, but relatively rare uh, objects where there were enough copies that it didn't cause too much of a, um, too much eye raising if a, a couple more came along, but th there weren't so many that it wasn't worth nothing. Um, but then I, I just very recently came across this, uh, this, these two documents. Um, this is a 1626 uh, document, a petition printed in Madrid um, about opening up um, new trade routes in uh, South America. And um, it's not very valuable. It was sold, the one on the right was sold at auction for about 200 euros last year. And it was, it's on the market now for $16,000. Uh, I guess that is quite, quite uh, a lot of money, but the, the forger is not making that money. I mean, no one's gonna make that money after this talk, but um, <laughs> the, the forger was, you know, this is, this is kind of like, like Brian's point, the, the low hanging fruit here. I, I, I thought that the forgers would only be going for relatively few, relatively high risk, but if it works out, you're talking hundreds of thousand dollars. That's, uh, you know, it's like heist jobs. Whereas this is like uh, going, into, going into a store and, and just grabbing money from the till kind of thing. So I, I guess this is related to our previous question. The, the technologies, the internet, the, uh, the way that you can bypass traditional exclusionary uh, social networks uh, and just sell the stuff. Um, I see no reason why this is not a, an epidemic, uh, for want of a better, better word, uh, problem that we are just entering the first wave of. So um, I think we're going to see a lot more and that we still don't really know what to do about it. Sobering news. Um, what are your thoughts, Julie? That's such a great conversation. Um, well, um, one of the things I'm noticing is uh, not so many new forgeries, but forgeries that are on the move. So things that uh, get collected by one person and get sort of approved by a certain body of people. And as Nick was saying, you know, a lot of this research isn't being done in a way that makes that information public. Uh, in, the, in the circles that I go in, a lot of this is uh, like whispered conversations. Um, you know, drink a few uh, glasses of sake, somebody tells you what they really think. Um, you know, then you get into this whole situation and then, or I've walked through galleries with people and we've just sat there and said, well, not that one and not that one. But, you know, the, the power systems that are in place are so hard to fight against, you know, so I'm, sitting on a project right now and I've been thinking about publishing it for a long time, but if I publish it, that's going to call uh, question some very important people's careers in my field that could be detrimental to me in all kinds of ways. And so I'm now that I'm a certain age, I'm just going to go for it. But, you know, a, a few years ago, I was really nervous about that. And that's the thing that I think bears keeping in mind here is that um, if you're in a precarious position in any kind of way or, or you're in a kind of conflicted position, you can really be at risk if you, if you see these things. And I also wanted to pick up on something that Kevin was saying about stories. And this is the thing that I find so powerful is that people like to create these stories around these, these artists as, as geniuses, as spectacular kinds of um, 
people in their own lives and we get sucked into that story. We get sucked into the story of how the thing was found. But one of the stories that I'm fighting against in my own work is, is a kind of story of a, a pre-modern, pure Japan um, with certain kinds of um, uh, sexual relationships that were more open than they are today, where um, people who were uh, indentured uh, sex workers uh, were doing that for their own pleasure or the images show them as, as doing that for their own pleasure without taking on board any of the really gruesome facts about their own um, experiences or their own lives. And a lot of people, it seems to me, collect these things because they want to believe in this pre-modern, this beautiful world, this world before Japan opened up and industrialized and modernized and had the fastest trains or whatever, you know, this, this kind of uh, illusion um, is, is very disturbing and very problematic. And um, I see that um, uh, some of, I've been tracking some paintings and I've, I've been noticing them appearing here and there, popping up in new places. Um, so for, some of these forgeries are on the move and when they're on the move and they get brought to a new place, often they're heralded as great new discoveries. And that can result in, you know, more people buying tickets to go to the exhibition, um, tourist dollars, established careers, do all these other kinds of things. And so that's a really uh, interesting thing. And I just went online the other day too and did a little Googling around about forgeries and, and, and discovered a new one that I didn't know about. It was in the New York Times a few years ago. And it has to do with basically workshops in China that are reproducing paintings by famous artists like Qi Bai She and Xu Bei Hong, these, these turn of the century, early 20th century sort of um, proletariat heroes and you know, hero figures in the story of art. And so um, now we also have a different kind of thing, a, a different kind of market and a different kind of production for that. So that's it's all this kind of problematic thing. And I think unless we are historians or bibliographers, scholars, librarians, dealers get together and we say, we're gonna establish some protocols for certain kinds of individuals, we're never going to actually um, do anything more than that. Because I've been in the room where there are six art historians and, and, and we all say, that looks good to me. And that's the kind of group think that's a really problematic if we don't establish particular standards, we then get fooled by people like Van Meegeren. Wow, thanks Julie. Um, Kevin. Yeah, uh, I'll be brief. I, you know, I write a, in Vanka a little bit about this um, and expertise and the question of expertise and being able to capture it. The short version of your uh, answer is yes, I think they are on the rise. I don't just mean uh, forgeries, but sort of fakery overall. And, um, you know, Orson Welles has this great quote in F for Fake, which is a terrific film if you haven't seen it. Uh, it was on the Criterion Collection. Uh, I assume it's streamable in, on that service now. But um, he says, if there are no experts, would there be any for forgeries? If there were no experts, would there be forgeries? And, you know, he's trying to get us to think about how expertise is involved and, and that, you know, uh, and I think Julie mentioned some kind of version of, of what that can do. I think we're now in a strange place because, as I argued in Bunk, uh, in the 19th century in American sort of public life, uh, everyone could be an expert. That's what P.T. Barnum promised. You could come see a sideshow and see for yourself. Is this person really the man, wild man from Borneo? What do you think? And all of that was, of course, uh, sort of paying mind to a kind of democratic notion and also um, notions of race that were being uh, exploited by, by Barnum and others. And I think now we're in a strange time where there are no experts. Um, you know, there expertise is frowned upon. So even sort of, uh, you know, there's not just forgery, but in, in the pandemic crisis, there's quackery <laughs> of fake things that are supposed to help us. I mean, we're in a, a moment when, you know, the term deep fake gets used a lot, but I think that it's, it's troubling to see the ways that things play on that. Um, now, it's no, there's no reason to think the book trade will somehow be exempt from that. And in fact, I think what you see, um, again, are some of these stories that prop up things that it's, it's, I think sometimes what Brian has mentioned, which is it's not so much people only faking, it's also they're creating these stories about what's 
supposed to be important and what's supposed to be interested, interesting because the ground under book, the book trade has shifted. And so you have to come up with a story in some ways and that almost allows people to fake a story, make something more interesting than it really is. Ryan, you wanna pick up the thread? Um, I, I agree with Kevin that, that, that forgeries are certainly on the rise. Um, I do think that it's something that uh, we need to be much more um, on the watch for and, and treat a lot of objects a lot more skeptically. Um, you know, it, when I started to a certain extent, um, you could almost take for granted that a signature that, was, that didn't add much of a value to a book was sort of by default genuine. Um, if there was that, if there was no real sort of significant monetary value added, that that it was it was probably okay. And that's just not the case anymore. Um, I see lots of forged books um, uh, that e even accounting if the signature had been right doesn't really add much more to the value of the book. Um, so uh, uh, I do think we need to be a lot more skeptical. And and as booksellers, um, I think that that what that means is that um, uh, I think we need to take a much more proactive approach to learning about the kinds of frequently forged and fake documents that we handle. Um, I know when I started, I sort of felt like, um, and I know some, some dealers that, that I talked to, you know, when you talk to them about things like fakes and forgeries, you know, you hear a lot about um, uh, gut and you hear a lot about sort of comparing signatures. Um, uh, there's a kind of form of connoisseurship or expertise um, as, as Kevin talks about. Um, but the, the longer that I do this, and I, and I try to teach, I, I actually teach the fakes and forgeries uh, session at the Antiquarian Book Seminar. And part of what I try to impart during that session, and what I've learned more and more as I've gotten further along in my career, is that um, there really is a process. There really are methods you can use um, that will yield different results than just sort of compare, comparing two signatures or kind of eyeballing it and, and seeing if it looks right or even getting a second opinion, which is sometimes something you want to do. Um, you know, so I think at a bare minimum, you know, we as booksellers need to, you know, um, uh, be proactive about our own learning. You know, we, I, I, a basic book for every bookseller would be Ken Rendell's book on fakes. It would be Joe Nichols' book on fakes. Um, if you handle any kind of duplicated materials, um, I think you need to at least have a passing um, uh, uh, knowledge of how to identify prints by Van Vergasgoins. Um, you really do kind of have to take it upon yourself um, to educate yourself and to know that a more systemic approach is possible um, and figure out what those systems are. I mean, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, hopefully, in, in the next couple questions about what some of those might look like. Thanks, Brian. And, and actually, that leads right up to our next question, um, which is, what methods do you employ when authenticating a document in your field of expertise? Are bibliographical methods particularly useful for you? And are there additional strategies or other resources that would be helpful for our audience to know about? And we'll start with you, Brian. Since oh, okay. Um, well, to, to pick up on my last point, I, I actually think the, the greatest tool um, at anyone's disposal when they're, when they're looking at a piece that might be under question is just first a deep skepticism um, sort of treating every document as guilty until proven innocent. Um, and second, and, and this is sort of the more, the more difficult one, is to kind of keep your mind constantly attuned to the varieties of cognitive bias that we are all susceptible to, um, and especially things like cognitive bias. You know, we all want the thing to be right. Um, and I, whenever I find myself making excuses for something, that's always a sign to me to kind of take a step back um, and think a little bit more critically. Um, and uh, one of the, you know, one of the ways to think about this, and it's a thing we hammer home at the, at the book seminar uh, to, our, to our students and seminarians is sort of look at the book to train yourself to kind of approach the object in a, in a, as objective um, and with as few assumptions as possible. Um, and then work, from, work your conclusions from that point forward. Um, and, and I'll just, I'll point to two, two quick things. Um, in my troll of eBay this morning, um, I saw one, one of the higher priced flyers that actually got sold. Um, uh, the seller touted, you know, I would, I'll, I'll actually read the quote. I will not offer anything that I'm not 100% sure and certain of its authenticity. Um, and when I looked at the, I didn't even need to have the document in front of me. When I looked at the flyer, um, the, the address of the venue, two thirds of it or three quarters of it were completely cut off. You couldn't read the address. Um, well, that's not a flyer that any venue would ever put into circulation, just logically. 
um, it's not an authentic document because no one would use it. Um, what's much more likely, and in fact almost certain, is that over over several generations of reproducing it, the the address has just slowly been lost. Um, and I'll also, you know, just show you another example. I wasn't going to use any slides today, but I got offered some books just today, literally this afternoon. And I thought, okay, the timing is is too perfect. I, I need to show these. Um, I'm going to show you some um, books that I was offered today. Um, I'm going to go backwards very quickly because I'm going to go in order. Um, and you don't actually need to pay any attention to the signatures or the quality of the signatures, although they do progressively get worse. Um, I, I sort of looked at this Philip Roth and thought, okay, Stephen King, fine. Nelson Mandela, uh, I'm getting a little more skeptical now. Um, Isaac Asimov, uh, uh, John Updike, oh boy. Um, P.G. Woodhouse, uh, and finally Dan Brown. Um, we don't actually have to talk about the quality of the signatures. Um, Actually, the only thing you need to notice about these in order to have your, your skepticism raised and, and to be on guard is that all of these are done with essentially the same pen, despite the fact that they are, you know, approximately four decades worth of, uh, of signatures, um, all coming to me from one source. Um, so that immediately uh, just sort of set my alarm bells off. Um, so often you don't really need any special training. You don't need any great techniques. Um, you just really need to look at the thing that's in front of you and try not to bring too many assumptions to it. Lovely examples. Kevin? Sorry, I'm still laughing about that. The <laughs> pen marks, uh, those are great. I, I don't have a, as much to add just about comparing. You know, I, I find that, you know, I would probably speak to both the the advantages and disadvantages of con continuership, as Brian pointed out. Like you can see a fake that suits you, but you know when I used to, uh, I wrote a book about Jean Michel Basquiat, and uh, for fun I would go on eBay. If you type in Jean Michel Basquiat, you'll see the wildest fakes that don't even look like him. And so I, I guess the question I start to have is why are people faking in that obvious way? Um, and it, it isn't only just money, that's the, the thing. But yeah, um, I think deep skepticism is your, your friend, um, and, and I think Brian put it really well. Julie? Yeah, I will um, third those remarks and say skepticism is where I always start. And I always start by, you know, thinking about uh, taking in the whole picture that I'm looking at and then then I start doing a very, very close uh, uh, analysis of things like materials and to think really deeply about the ways in which materials are being used in these things. And then to think about the ways in which, um, to think about the sources that the forger might have used. And this kind of requires um, the ability to spend a lot of time in a library or to have a kind of familiarity of uh, the kind that I know others have in their fields with the way things should look, right? So here in this case, you can see a potential source for this image. Um, that's um, very clear. And recently I worked on an exhibition about Utamaro and I was working on, on the painting here on the right, Woman with the Shamisen. And nothing about this, there are sort of key issues here for this, about this painting that really I struggled with. Um, one of them for me as an art historian is thinking about the way in which the artist would have worked. So I have to kind of imagine um, the kind of training and knowledge that Utamaro himself would have had. And so there were certain dimensions about the sort of flatness of the body um, that were troubling to me because um, that body should have a weight and a presence the pattern shouldn't be in uh, going over the surface in the way that it was. The, the angle of the head seemed so unnaturalistic to me and problematic. Um, the costumes, all these other things. And then what we often do in, in Japanese art history is we, we look very clear, carefully at the signature and seal and there were issues with those as well, as well as with the inscriptions. So then I'm, you're starting to get this kind of um, unsettled feeling and starting to think about, you know, how, how might this have worked? But the story is good because the story that's being told here is, well, he painted this just before he died. You know, it, it's just this kind of story that gets put out about it. And people want to believe that. They want to believe that there's a real Uchamaro. Now, here's where, like, as a historian, you have to go and you have to dig in and you have to start thinking, like, what, 
Was Uchimaru known in his own lifetime as a painter? None of the documents describe him as a painter from his own lifetime. Um, what does that mean? Then you do, do things like you compare to other things that have been authenticated, like the painting on the left. You compare to prints um, because there is a body of prints, but you have to be careful here because, of course, there are other hands involved in making prints. But here's where I started to have the breakthrough, and this has to do now with, with things like costume that you have to pay attention to, right? You have to think about like, what does her hairstyle look like? What does her makeup look like, right? And so one of the things I learned in this process is that Uchamara one, and this is just the kind of thing that I'm still trying to made the hairstyle in a certain kind of way where Uchamara the second made it this other kind of hairstyle. And this is like, this is the kind of research that, that you know, you have to then look at period costume books and clothing books to get the point. Um, the other thing is then to then go and then look at other features of costume. And in this case, to look at the lip treatment. Now the lip treatment here is this kind of style called Sasa Beni. And it's this, you paint on enough of this, this material um, until it starts to glow. Um, in this way, like a, a green glow. And people were saying, you know, the lip treatment is only after 1811. Uchimaru dies in 1806. That's a huge problem. And it, but in order to ascertain that that was correct, I had to go to the only, to a, to a makeup store that has this original material in Japan. And I got to try on the Sasabeni. And this is like a whole part of being an art historian that you never expect, that you're going to learn things about things that people would have known at that time um, because they're still um, present um, today. So it can kind of lead you down this trail that you never, ever expected. But to, we have to think, you know, we have to think in a couple of different planes. One, what would the forger have none known? What would he have copied? And what would the artist have known as part of his natural milieu? And when you see this kind of discrepancy around something as simple as lipstick, it can really change what you know. So then that helped me to basically say that this was a painting by Uchamara's student, but this then later passed off by dealers as an authentic Uchamara. So um, again, you know, to echo everyone else, that's, that's what I would, would sort of say here. And I thought that was just such an amusing incident that I had to share it with the world um, uh, and to, uh, to help us return to this question of, of skepticism and, and methodology. Wow, I can't think, I, I never would have thought of that as a method for a, authenticating a, a, a picture. Um, Nick. You haven't been putting on any lipstick, have you? No. Uh, the, the might be some noise. The, a huge storm has just rolled in. So um, I've done I've done some pretty weird stuff, but not not historical lipstick yet. Um, <laughs> this is yeah. This is it, it is important to think though that every single piece of evidence is admissible because what you're basically trying to do is seize the anachronism inherent in the object. You know this the the point of bibliography is to explain how the object, as, as Michael Suarez has said a thousand times, how did this object come to be as it now is, right? We want to understand the production, the, the entire life of the object. And as Kevin says in his book, you know, these are objects which have, have not lived the lives that they claim to live. They are imposter, Im imposter objects. Um, I wanted to just to show you the Volsimuller gauze. Um, which were, uh, I was asked to take a look at a couple of years ago. Uh, so this was a, an extremely rare and extremely valuable sheet of paper. Um, I was presented with this as by somebody who's already skeptical and uh, a map dealer, Alex Clawson, who um, didn't tell me why he was skeptical, which I think is a really interesting technique. He said, you know, I don't really wanna be involved in the process of deauthenticating this if that's what happens. Um, but I think there's something wrong with it. What's, what's the thing that's wrong with it for you? And a group of us got together, each with different fields of expertise, and each of us said, well, obviously, it's the, um, 
you know, the paper experts said, like, from across the room, I see the papers wrong. And then um, we each found something that just didn't make sense about the internal story that the object should have been uh, telling. And if we, uh, so we compared it with uh, other objects. There we had to be really, really careful because it turned out that one of the control objects that we were comparing it with uh, was also a forgery. That was the kind of unexpected uh, extra um, valued destruction that we managed uh, that day. So the Bavarian State Library's million dollar uh, Voltimula Gores were also uh, necessarily fakes once the uh, Christie's Gores turned out to be fakes. So we, you go, I mean, it's similar to any well-trained historical analysis, right? You contextualize and you, you work synchronically and diachronically. You go through the history of the object and you go out sideways at the same time. And you just try to find out the provenance of the object. You compare it to all other exemplars or as many as you have access to. You think about what the conditions of access are. Are they the same as the forger's conditions of, uh, conditions of access? Are there ways that I can get hold of different sample groups that will suddenly reveal that I'm not just looking at third generation JK Rowling signatures again. Um, and then you start to think about some of the categories of bibliographic description that are used. So you might say, um, so here, the Voltimilla Gores were described as having, this is a very hard image to make sense of, but I'll try and lead you through it, uh, a watermark of a bull's head. So um, I don't have a good, uh, does that, no. Um, you can see this line that I'm trying to trace here is a bull's head and the horns go up there and there. Um, when we looked at this, held it up to the light, it looks like it has a bull's head watermark. But when you look at it in raking light, you see that this is actually incised into the paper. So um, it's fulfilling some of the descriptive categories required of the object, uh, but it's not um, like, a real bull's head mark. It's just kind of ticking a box, but it's getting there by the wrong route. So it's really this kind of just multi, uh, you're, you're just being a real jerk to the object, just asking really annoying questions like a seven year old kid, but why, 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 why is it like that? Why is it not otherwise? Can I think of another plausible explanation? So um, a degree of really radical skepticism, I think is, is uh, our best tool. Now, obviously, we can't bring that with us to every single object, but um, when necessary, it's, it's what we have to do. Great. Thanks, Nick. I think um, we are going to move now to our live chat because we have many, many, many questions that have been streaming in, and it is a little bit after five o'clock. So um, this concludes the initial portion of our conversation. And now we're going to turn to some of the questions that have been coming in. And I'm gonna start with the first one that is coming from Emma Sarconi. Emma asks um, a question that relates to something that Brian was talking about. She writes, thinking about Brian's comments on expertise regarding authentication, guilty until proven innocent and varieties of cognitive bias, how does the sale or rise of forgeries intersect with the problem of stolen, looted, and exploited material? And I'll let whoever on the panel wants to, to address that first unmute themselves and, and go ahead. All right, I'll jump in. Just because okay. I've got some, just to get it going, um, it in, intersects in the cases I've looked at extremely strongly. Uh, and there's a there's a tendency to um, by forgers to say this is a victimless crime. All we're doing is adding extra copies to the market. What's really the harm in that? We were going to move on and, and discuss this um, this question of uh, what damage is done by forgeries, um, and I think we all have strong op opinions about that. But one of the pieces of one of the um, things that is most damaging about forgeries is that they are 
they frequently seem to uh, be used to replace genuine objects in special collections, in uh, state archives, in national libraries, in collections of cultural patrimony. And uh, so the removal from those places even um, it is not a victimless crime. That's even, even if you replace it with a really good forgery, you're messing with the historical record, but you're also despoiling uh, cultural patrimony. Um, so I think that uh, we have to keep insisting on that because otherwise you just kind of say, yeah, good one. You know, you nearly caught us out with that, with that forgery. That was, that was a kind of schoolboy prank, slap on the wrist. And actually we need to prosecute and send people to jail for this. And it's not happening. Thanks, Nick. Um, does anyone else want to address this question? I mean, I think there's a long history of them being interrelated. Uh, you know, just to take uh, Ben Megren, he was make, selling fakes to uh, the Netherlands and to his home uh, country and make, doing all that. And then meanwhile, the Nazis are, are taking and looting uh, from Jewish families actual art. Uh, same thing with they're labeling things degenerate and then selling uh, the degenerate art for their own profit. So there's a real disturbing tie and a kind of black market that can kind of crop up around these things. Um, I don't have uh, as recent or obvious examples uh, as that, but I think there is this long history. Um, you sort of see it in uh, closer to home and things like, I know, slave materials or materials that were supposedly related to enslaved peoples, uh, shackles being one example. And sometimes for good reason, you know, for just wanting to have that um, uh, object and then other reasons for monetary reasons, you see those things faked. Um, and, you know, obviously that's just, you know, it, it's hard to even talk about because I think it's so disturbing and goes so to uh, the heart of, of who we are uh, and, and uh, what binds and separates us, as it were. And I think that for me, the, the damage, um, uh, besides what Nick is talking about, is that, you know, a fake or forgery, it not only says that this fake thing is genuine, it makes genuine things seem fake. Um, and I think that story that changes history really becomes a problem. And, and that's where uh, we need to be ever vigilant. Thanks, Kevin. That was extremely well put and very moving, um, what you said. Joan, do you want to uh, answer the, or address the next question? Yes. Yeah, so Amy Bishop is asking, Brian mentioned some books as a good place to start learning about forgeries. Could he repeat those titles? Um, sure. Uh, th the first one was, um, Ken, I actually just mentioned the authors, which was um, probably not the best way to do that. Um, the first was Ken Rendell, and, and his book is appropriately called Forging History. Um, and the second book was by Joe Nickel um, with two L's. Um, and uh, that's called, I think, um, Pen, Ink, and Evidence. Um, the other book that I mentioned was uh, Bamber Gascoigne's uh, How to uh, Identify Prints. Thanks, Brian. Um, we have another question coming in. Question is, in the current market, what are the hot spots and forgeries, facsimiles, et cetera, ephemera, books? I think that you've been addressing this to some degree, but does anyone want to jump in? I'll go. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I think actually this panel shows actually something that's rather disturbing, which is that I'm not sure that we can generalize. It seems to be coming from all over. Yeah. Um, and that there, you know, there, there might not be a place where you can kind of safely uh, get a foothold and, and sort of feel secure, um, you know, uh, uh, from, from hand press books to, you know, Americana to punk flyers to um, uh, 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 Japanese art. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really coming from all over the place. And, and again, the technologies, both from the print side and from the for lack of a better way of putting it, distribution side are, are, are really, you know, in many ways working against us at the moment. Um, so I, I don't know that I can identify a particular one that seems particularly uh, more troubling than another. Thanks. Anyone else have something to say about that? I'm going to jump ahead to a question that just sort of jumped out at me. 
um, from Philip Troutman. I'm thinking about some of the more obviously fake slavery related objects, especially slave badges that didn't exist in most places. What do you all think about why collectors, fans, collect these things even when those objects are so easily identified even by a layperson as fake? The collection of slavery related objects may be problematic on several levels already. Uh, since I brought it up, I can mention it. Um, you know, I mean, I think I, it goes back to a bit to, to Wise's, um, you know, forgery of Runaway Slave uh, by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, which she did sell for uh, the abolitionist cause. Why forge that specific document among many others? Um, and I think some of it has to do with unease and exactly what the document brings up. The document is already uh, disturbing the atmosphere um, and it becomes uh, the forgery is a way to kind of control that, regularize it. Um, it's strange because the thing that when I was thinking about fakes or learning about them, say about Basquiat, um, what was hard for me at first to understand is that what a forger goes after is not like the edges of an artist's oeuvre, but the center, like the most obvious thing. You're not going to forge a Basquiat and not put a crown in it. I mean, you have to. Um, and, and so that's what becomes really weird. It's like that would be really obvious because if you know what they look like, maybe you would sense uh, a fake one. But of course, you have to have it look kind of obvious in some way. And what's strange about a forgery is then later they become, you know, the obviousness becomes a double thing where you both are seeing how the forger was of their own time and the forger was also trying to reproduce an earlier time. So there's this strange double vision that almost becomes a triple vision looking back on it. It's like, well, how did anyone believe that in that time? Um, that said, I think the larger question, you know, because enslaved people were sold and bought and sold, you know, it's hard to wrap our imagination around that at times. And I think the historical record um, tells us so much uh, about that, but we also want sort of some, some of us, some folks, I should say, um, want, is it a memento? Is it a, a thing to ward off the past to make it real in some way? And I think there's a, a, a kind of unease in that. And then also a, a kind of, you know, dare I say, a, a different kind of ownership that's, that's at work. Um, but I have to say, the flip side of that is if you're in the sort of Schomburg Center and you see actual slave documents, or if you're at the National Museum of African American History and Culture and you experience the slavery galleries, those actual objects do have this charge. They do have this power and tell a story that sometimes you can talk about all day, but then seeing uh, really changes. Um, we have a slavery show up now. You can't go see it because we're close to the public uh, due to the pandemic for a little bit longer. But, you know, seeing those actual objects, and I'll just give you an example. You know, there's uh, the things that to me in our show that's called Subversion and the Art of Slavery, um, that's most powerful are these ledgers um, kept in the 19th century to ensure enslaved persons. And by, I mean, ensure them, I mean, ensure slaveholders. And so that's just disturbing to see these large ledgers which tell a story uh, of all the causes of their deaths, which are horrible in and of themselves. Just one page will bring slavery home in a way that is powerful. Uh, I don't think that's something people forge. You know, this is sort of a little off topic, but I think it's important to note that the genuine, uh, you know, if that somehow had gotten forged, I think that that genuine object would be affected uh, in our power. You know, the power that we see coming from it is because we know what that story uh, tells and what this object that can seem, you know, was just a, this person was just a line in a ledger. Uh, but of course was a living being um, that this ledger uh, captures. Well, thank you, um, Julie. I think we have, we're have we coming up on the last minute of our session. So I, um, if you want to reply to, um, that'd be great. And then we'll need to wrap it up. Really wanted to sort of underscore what Kevin is saying about this um, 
way in which the story functions and the way in which the object represents so much to us. And some of the objects that we've been talking about or that you've been hearing about can almost have a kind of reliquary status such that you touch it and you feel like you're touching the other person or you're touching the sense of genius or you're touching something else. And the question about why faking some things that might seem like they don't need to be faked be or that you can recognize them so quickly is that sometimes I think we hunger for something that is lost and we want to fill in that that space and something that Kevin um, talked about um, with the Hitler diaries and other things that that we want to fill that space in and we want to know more about it and sometimes these objects seem to have that reliquary kind of status for us. Um, what troubles me and to return a little bit to what Nick was saying was was how sometimes the fakes can also um, obscure the history. They can create such a beautiful illusion that we forget to look beyond that illusion and we fall headfirst into it and we don't compare it to act what was actually um, experienced by the people of that time. Wow, this, um, this has been a truly um, eye-opening um, and deep conversation. I think we're all grateful to each of you for your insight and for the time and thought you put into this conversation and that you're putting into your work every day. Um, there's so much more we could say, but um, we do need to close. And I hope that these conversations will continue offline in productive ways so that we can think about some of the really important issues that we've addressed today and how we as a community can work towards um, addressing them constructively. Um, in closing, I just want to say that we are doing this work online together, um, but that we do hope to be able to meet in person next year when it is safe again to do so. There are scholarship opportunities here at Rare Book School, including the Andrew W. Mellon Fellowship for Diversity, Inclusion, and Cultural Heritage, as well as the uh, Andrew W. Mellon Society for Fellows in Critical Bibliography. Um, these programs will be looking for applicants in the fall and we're going to be advertising other opportunities. So if you're tuning in and learning about Rare Book School for the first time, please do look at those opportunities um, because each of the people speaking today is an RBS faculty member and this is the kind of conversation that we really uh, want to continue with you in person. So um, thank you again to our panelists. You were brilliant. And I'm just honored to have been able to be part of a conversation like this today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. It's been great. Bye.